Welcome to NYLA 2020 On Demand. This session was previously recorded for the NYLA 2020 virtual conference. It is available to you through December 31st, 2020. Please note, once viewed, each on-demand program is eligible for one continuing education credit. Links to materials and presenter contact information have been archived in a Google folder and are made available after conference. Support files and documents can be found in session files below the program description. Any questions about the NYLA 2020 virtual conference digital platform can be directed to Christina at NYLA.org or you can call 800-252-6952. Congrats, you're a prison librarian is sponsored by Court and co-sponsored by ESRT. Greetings, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Andrea Snyder. And I am the Outreach and Training Coordinator for the Pioneer Library System. And I'm really excited um, for our panel today. Um, congrats, you're a prison librarian. Now what? Um, so really looking forward to a discussion with our panelists and really kind of diving into what, what it looks like to work in and uh, with correctional facilities. So to start, we're going to do some introductions. Uh, Diego, if you could go first. Good morning, everyone. My name is Diego Sandoval Hernandez. I am, I am the Correctional Services Librarian for the Brooklyn Public Library. And Matthew? My name is Matthew Cassidy. I'm the Senior Librarian at Woodburn Correctional Facility in Sullivan County. And Melinda? I'm Melinda Appleby. I'm the senior librarian at Willard Drug Treatment Campus um, in the Finger Lakes region. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start actually with Melinda. Could you tell us a little bit about your facility and, then, and what makes it unique? Sure. Um, Willard is a 97-day treatment drug and alcohol treatment program. Um, the inmates are only there for 97 days. They do intensive drug and alcohol rehabilitation. Um, the inmates um, have either substance abuse or sales or alcohol use in their past or related to their crime. And Matthew, could you tell us a little bit about your facility? Sure, uh, Woodburn Correctional Facility is a medium security facility. Um, houses approximately 800 individuals uh, that have an average age of 45. Uh, more than half of the population has a high school degree or higher, and the majority are looking to return home in one to three years. Um, it's also one of the six prisons in New York State that the Bard Prison Initiative operates in. Um, if attendees have not watched Ken Burns' um, College Behind Bars uh, documentary or read about how the BPI debate team defeated Harvard, they really should. And Diego, I know you're not directly in a facility, but can you tell us about the work that you do? For sure. Uh, alongside our team, uh, we serve uh, around, right now, six different facilities. Um, four facilities are located in Rikers Island. One is located in the Bronx. It's a boat. Uh, and then the Brooklyn Metropolitan Det Detention Center. Um, we, in most of the facilities, we do a rolling cart service. And then we also have a, a different programs that we do around the different facilities. Um, unlike, it seems like my colleagues, we don't work out of the facilities where we are there for the day and then uh, different days of the week, we provide services for the different facilities. Again, this is with my, my colleagues. Awesome. Thank you. So I kind of just want to dive right in and kind of ask a question. What's one thing that you wish you would have known like kind of going back, you wish that someone would have told you your first day or your first week that would have been really helpful in your job. And let's start with Matthew. Um, so I, uh, it would be more of a, a message from current me to past me about how much I would actually find myself enjoying not having my phone on me all the time. It sounds really weird, but um, being able to uh, unplug regularly uh, and actually go back to handwriting and working with uh, notepads and, and paper <laughs> weekly schedules um, has been really uh, helpful not only to my, my own organization and, and, and retention. Um, it's just, it just was one of those unexpected things that I, I did not see coming. Um, I, 
And so for those who may not know, can you uh, kind of briefly explain what, um, so I work with public libraries and public libraries, we have easy internet access, we have easy access to computers and technology. What sort of um, restrictions and limitations are, are you working with in, within the facility for both yourself as, as a librarian and then also with the individuals that you're supporting? Sure, yeah, so um, like most uh, docs facilities in New York State, docs is Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. There's a lot of acronyms, as, as my, my colleagues here today know in, in, the, <laughs> in the world of corrections, there's a million acronyms. Um, as far as technological restrictions, um, no phones are allowed, no smartwatches. Um, I have no internet access within the facility library itself. Um, I do have uh, an outdated, though functional, uh, integrated library system and um, a server computer as well as four um, clerk computers um, in the library. Um, and the inmates, they have no access, or the incarcerated people, they have no access to, um, to the internet. Uh, they have tablets, but the tablets are um, facilitated through a third party um, and they have to go, go to a, a kiosk in order to actually exchange information. There's no, there's really no internet access other than in secure office facilities um, within the prison itself. So when I want to check my email, for example, my work email, I actually have to uh, close the library and then I have to go to the education office um, and then log into a secure computer there that um, the incarcerated people in Woodburn have no access to that room or um, can really get to that at all. So, yeah, it's, it's very strict. It's, um, yeah, there's, uh, technologically, it's very, very restricted. That was a learning curve for me as I support mm -hmm. uh, three to four <laughs> correctional facilities and just having to kind of balance how I even communicate with the librarians that I work with. Yeah. Um, Melinda, can you tell what's one thing that you kind of wish you would have known? Um, well, it was 14 years ago, so <laughs> I'm trying to remember if there was anything. But one piece of advice that I have carried with me all the way through from the beginning, and we still hear this in training all the time, is it's easier to turn a no into a yes than turn a yes into a no. So, um, you know, as I've worked in max, I've worked in medium and um, through the years, you know, you get to know your inmate workers, you get to know the, the regulars that come in the library. And, uh, you know, a lot of times you hear, oh, Ms. A, can you do me a favor? Or Ms. A, will you do this for me? And I will say, well, it depends, or I'll just say flat out no. So, and they'll bring issues. If I can help them with an issue, I will, but you know, if I know it's a security issue or I know it's something that they should be talking to their counselors about, I will um, divert them to them. Yeah, so, but I continue to use that philosophy. I was um, lucky enough to be a, a clerk for a year before um, at Livingston Correctional Facility, before I was, you know, right into the library. And uh, so I had the advantage of observing for a whole year how my sen that senior librarian interacted with the other inmates, um, with the exec suite, with security. So I learned a lot. I had an advantage before I got in there full on. Yeah. That would be very helpful. Yeah, definitely. I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Diego, what do you wish you would have known before? Or, or going on, kind of what advice would you give? Um, maybe I wish, what I wish I would have known before was how much of an uphill battle our job is. I mean, for us, we don't have, we, we don't have physical uh, libraries where, where we are. So we, we, we do our service in rolling carts. Um, we are not a priority for the Department of Corrections, you know? Like, we have to, like, justify our existence constantly. Um, and, and so that, that, I mean, like that always just kind of feels like, you know, you find your allies where you can. Um, but sometimes it is a little frustrating. Um, and like, even just looking at, our, at my day, sometimes it's like, I spend so much time traveling and like getting, like passing security 
and like checkpoints and the actual time I get to spend with my patients is very limited sometimes because of that, because there will be an alarm and I'm going to have to wait three hours. And so I'm losing that amount of time that I was going to supposed to spend with my patrons during my service. Um, so it, it, it's a little frustrating at times. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that, that's what my kind of led into my next question a little bit, talking about kind of what security you have to go through. So what for you, and I know that, that Matthew and Melinda, you also, when you enter the facility, you have to go through security. I've, I've had to do it when I visited, but Diego, can you tell us what, like kind of what the security looks, what that process looks like for you even just to start being able to actually do the work and provide the services to people? So, I mean, it's New York City, so everything is sort of very far away. Like, it's a long commute either to the Bronx or to Riker, Rikers Island. And so I'm going to talk about Rikers Island because I feel like Rikers Island is the most, uh, is the one that has the most checkpoints. Um, so you essentially take a city bus that takes you to the island. And once you get to the island, you, you go for your first checkpoint. Um, because I'm a service provider, I don't get the level of scrutiny that, that visitors get. So, like, I don't get any of the drug dogs, dogs smelling me. I don't get patting down. At least I don't have to go through that. I just go through um, just like your regular metal detector for the first checkpoint, and then I get on a bus, that, another bus that then takes me to the uh, to the next facility, to the actual facility that I'm serving, and so waiting for the for another bus for like 15 minutes or or so to then take you to the next facility where once again you go for a metal detector. Um, once uh, there's a lot of times where you arrive and there's an alarm, so you need to stay there until the alarm is over. Um, so, and then again, it's just also it with us. It like very much depends on who the officer at the at the at the entrance is. If they don't know you, then they'll just ask who you are, demand to call your like your 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 um your your um your partner at the DOC, and then sometimes they're not at the desk, so then that means that you have to wait because it, it, because they're new at that desk and they haven't seen you, so it, and it, it's all just essentially arbitrary too, you know? Like you could find an officer who's been doing this for a while, who doesn't really, who just understands that the library, who knows that the library does service there, so then the level of scrutiny is less. It, so it, it, it just varies and it just depends who the person is, yeah. Can you, let's do Melinda, like once you've, you've gotten through security, you're ready to start your day. What does kind of a typical day look like for you? Um, well, I work an eight to four, Monday through Friday. I'm lucky in that regards. So I walk over to my building, um, go in, check my email, go to my office, get my coffee, say hi to everybody. The library opens at 8.15 for the first mod. So I walk down, unlock the library, um, guys start rolling in anywhere between 8.15 and 8.30. Um, so then I have the dorm come in the first half and then halfway through the mod, we switch it up and either a classroom comes in or um, another uh, dorm, all on a call out system. We <clears throat> go back for chow is 11.15. Um, I go back to my office, check my emails, do housekeeping stuff, write reports, um, phone calls, whatever I gotta do. Uh, try to get lunch in there too. And then uh, the library opens back up at 12.45. Um, and then we run, we do the same thing. We do a half a mod is um, call outs for the dorms. Second half of the mod is either um, dorm call outs or classroom coming in. And we are in there until 3.45. Uh, I head back to my office, close up, lock up, and head out at four o'clock. Yeah. When, when classes are coming in, what kind of classes are they, or what are they? Um, they uh, we have ABE, Advanced Basic, or I'm not even sure what these acronyms are. Pre-HSE, HSE, but they are all working towards the task, the new um, GED. So they come in, it's not very structured. They just like to have a little bit of a break and check out the library. I have open stacks, so they're allowed to peruse and, and check things out. 
the teacher does stay in there with me. Um, you know, I let them know it's your classroom. I don't take responsibility for any kind of uh, disciplinary action or anything like that. Um, but I'm there for questions, information, you know, guidance, that kind of stuff. When you, um, if it's not a classroom, are you in the library by yourself or is, do you have a, a CO, a guard kind of outside the library that if you needed help? Um, they are not in the library with us and my uh, the officer that covers my area is down the hall um, I don't know a few hundred feet away so I'm in there by myself um, I do carry a radio a PAS system a personal um, s alarm system um, but there is a lot of activity on the floor um, of my building so there's always COs walking by, um, you know, and other civilians in and out. So it's not like I'm, you know, hidden in the recesses of some building somewhere. So, <laughs> yeah. So and it's safe. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's the facilities that I have visited. Uh, that's kind of the impression I have too. Yep. Matthew, how does your day compare to Melinda's day? Is there anything that's kind of different or, more, or makes it unique compared to her day? Um, yeah, Melinda and I, uh, our days are, are fairly similar. Um, the times of, of modules and everything are a little different. Um, we have a, a, a rotating schedule depending on housing location um, so that all of the houses or, or the dorms um, or blocks have, have time every day, Monday through Friday. Um, so that's a little different. Uh, we also have classroom visits. Um, the library at Woodburn is actually in the school area itself. Um, so right around the corner are the classrooms as well as the Bard lab. Um, so, and also the gym is, is down the way as well. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, really our, our lunch, our, our, our lunch is um, a working lunch. So <laughs> we, um, that's really our time to work on collection development and uh, emails and all of that stuff. Pop over to Melinda because it looks like Diego, we may have lost him. Yeah. Um, Melinda, what kind of programming do you do? Um, are, or do you do programming? Um, I, I only do passive programming only because Willard's a 97 day program. So we don't have a lot of time to get into, um, you know, like a big read or, um, you know, active programming like that. Um, I've got Sudoku's out, crossword puzzles, word searches. Um, but when, you know, inmate, if inmates are not working or in school, they are immersed in the ASAP program, um, in the therapy stuff with big groups, small groups. They do peer intervention, um, you know, very, very treatment centered, treatment oriented, and they are super busy. Yeah, so passive programming for me, but that may change. Um, I don't have, we do have rec now where we didn't before. Um, we have a, a rec civilian. We didn't have that before. And uh, so now that's integrated into the program in the evenings. And I have a feeling that my eight to four cushy schedule is gonna change. And I might have a little more time in the evenings for that kind of stuff, so, yeah. Have you, um, has your work been at all impacted by, um, by kind of pandemic and by procedures that have changed? Um, I know that you were, oh, I believe, I'm making an assumption here, I know some of, some of the facility libraries librarians were not in the facility for a certain amount of time, but has that kind of Correct. impacted how you've done programming? Uh, for me, or no. Um, I actually, no, because I still just did passive programming, you know, with the Sudokus and the crossword puzzles and word searches and coloring and Zentangle. Um, those things, I made those things available um, to the dorms when we were out because we were considered not, we are considered non-essential. So we, our last day was March 17th and we were out of the facilities until June 1st. Um, so I did pop in and out because um, I had some, correct, some uh, books coming in that I needed to take care of and things like that. But um, 
while we were out, I made sure that the counselors had some of that passive programming stuff available. And I sent um, boxes of books to each of the 16 dorms. So they had um, that stuff available to them too. That's so awesome that you were in a position where you were able to still kind of make sure that people had access to something. Yeah, yes. So yeah. That, that's awesome. Diego, can you tell us about kind of the, when you're actually in the library, so you know, provide, well, I guess you're not in the library, you're pushing the book cart, but are you doing any type of programming other than providing books? Yeah, so we also do this program that's called Daddy and Me, um, in which we find people inside who are parents who have children outside, um, and then we give them an early literacy training. Um, we bring books with us that they get to look at, um, and uh, then uh, well, we show them how we do story time at, at the library, and then they get to read, the, uh, we record them reading th these books to their children. And then ideal, in an ideal situation, we then invite the family to come visit uh, their loved one for the day, and then they receive the package, uh, which is the book along with um, the, the recording and li some library goodies. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or or we just mail 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 that out if we can't have a family day. And then uh, last year we got a, a grant from the library to do a zine project, and essentially we picked uh, some of uh, we picked the facility we were working with, and essentially had a group of of guys take uh, different workshops on like comic comic book making, um, poetry making, and then we had them put together their own zine. Uh, we got to do that a couple of times. Um, we weren't able to do it more because we had uh, people in our team leave and, and it was just like a very, a moment of transition. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, so those are some of the programs we do aside from um, book service. With the zines, was that shared or published kind of or uh, kind of outside or because i know there's restrictions yeah. too with what can be right. shared right um we ideally we wanted to make this for them so we didn't really we didn't really make it available uh we also didn't really have the time to sort of come up with a contract to sort of lay, lay, make, make that clear and lay that out so we decided to just not share it and just just share it we did a similar thing with that, uh, with what we do with Daddy and Me, where we had the family come in, and then that's where we gave them the zines that the that people had created for the families. But that's it. I imagine there, there's a lot of pride. Yeah, exactly. For the people who are doing the creation to then be able to even just share it with their family or, or whoever that there's a lot of ownership, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matthew, what kind of because again, so you, your um, the the individuals out there for a longer period than Melinda's. So are you, what kind of programming are you, or have you done? Sure. Um, so like Melinda, we, I also do passive programming, um, but pre-pandemic, um, I had started a book discussion as well as a film series discussion, which was, um, uh, Oh, now I'm blanking. Um, anyways, it was a film discussion series looking at um, Japanese directors' influence on Western film. Uh, Kurosawa, that's the, that's, the, that's the director's name. Um, so I had a lot of passive programming as well. Um, so, you know, crossword puzzles. I also have a kind of tablet reading program going on uh, because a lot of the tablet uh, ebooks that are available to inmates are, are um, public domain. Um, so everything, you know, they go to the kiosk, everything's in the public domain, it's older. Um, but the nice thing about it, even though, you know, it's mostly public domain books that are available to them, is that friends and family also have access to those uh, books for free um, on, the, on the outside as well. So they can actually read along um, uh, with those books because they're public domain. So they can kind of have that kind of connection. Uh, with people on the outside. Um, 
I also started an art and literature publication that I'm collecting uh, submissions for. I have about uh, 30 pieces of writing and I think only seven drawings right now. Um, but um, I'm looking hopefully to put together some sort of uh, magazine, well-bound type publication. Um, and so that was, yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of different things are going on. And then actually my, my experience with the pandemic differed from uh, Melinda. Um, I actually, the longest period that I was actually outside of the facility was the very first week. Uh, then I was back one day a week and then two days a week. And then I've been back five days a week for several months, actually. Um, and I think it's, it differs by facility. Um, and, you know, but they decided they wanted me to come back on a um, more restricted schedule rather than not have me there at all. It, it makes me very happy that, you know, that like, the, the individuals have have had resources. Um, I know, so yeah. one of the things that we do at, um, at the... Andrea, I think you muted yourself. Whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> um, one of the things that we do at the system is provide interlibrary loan books to our correctional facilities, but because of the way that kind of the pandemic has impacted our services, it's not something we've been doing and so it makes me so it, it I feel good knowing that individuals still have access beyond yeah, I, what we're doing uh, I'm sorry to, I, I uh, yeah and the nice thing is, is that actually um, what I was able to do because in, interlibrary loans were being suspended and uh, the Ramapu Cat, Catskill library system which is the system that I work with they gave us plenty of notice ahead of time um, so what I started doing was ramping up um, collecting donations and I was able to bring in roughly 4,000 volumes uh, during that time uh, to kind of supplement the you know not having interlibrary loans to at least have some sort of new books coming into the facility. If I could give you a high five right now I would that's awesome um, so thank you for doing that. Uh, Diego were you at all impacted were you allowed to go into the facility or were your visits restricted? for a, a certain period of time? I have, I have still, we still are not clear to go back to the facilities. We have not been back to the facility since March 16th. Um, and the way it happened, everything happened so fast that we didn't even really have like a chance to be like, we're, we're, we're not going to come back. Um, so for the first few months, um, unlike my colleagues, I, I, I work for the Brooklyn Public Library. So we are like do outreach services to the jail facilities. So uh, I, I think for the first few months, we really, because we had to shift what we were doing, um, we really centered on doing more like public education, uh, popular education, but by public education um, on, on um, well, what's going on, the, like um, the effects of the pandemic in, in, in correctional facilities. So we had a bunch of panels. Um, and then midway through, once we started getting a clear idea of when we were going to be let back into libraries, not, not jail, but like our, like, because I, my office is at a regular library. I, my collection is at a regular library. And so throughout, throughout a few months, I'd been keeping touch with uh, the program coordinators at these facilities to try and, and come up with what we could do. So like, um, so we, we, we have, we have collections in the facilities um and so we because because we didn't have access to them we we talked to the program coordinators at these facilities to t tell them that to have essentially free range on those books so that like the people would have something to do um and so i mean because we are at so many different facilities um some were really good about about like making sure that those books were being distributed to people, others were not. It's hard for us to know what, what it really is happening. Um, and then once we were let back into the library, into the libraries, then we started doing the same thing where we also worked with the program coordinators, distributing surveys, asking people what if they want what books they wanted. And so we were mailing out books and that worked out worked for a little bit, but then um, it's 
because of the way things are right now, it, it, it was even, it's been hard even mailing out books because a lot of the books that I, I, I kept on sending to Rikers Island got re get rejected and then sent back to me. And that's a whole other set of issues that I have now to deal with the library because of that. Um, anyway, so yeah, no, um, it's, it's been very, very challenging, um, but it's also provided us with really great opportunities because of the pandemic. Um, I, it, the New York City was sort of pressured into providing tablets for everyone, and unlike, uh, and we need to be grateful because unlike other any other places, it's not tablets that are basically looking to uh, profit from individuals, um, and they've given us the chance to basically upload whatever content we want, and so that's kind of what we're working on now, creating seeing what we have out there that would be interesting for people inside that we can just upload to these tablets, but then seeing about uh, applying to grants to like not um, basically see everything that our library is doing and try and digitize it and see what would be useful to upload in these tablets and then also try and get money to like um, design curriculum specifically that people want. And so we're hoping that also by using these tablets, we'll be able to give people surveys so they can tell us what they what they want in these tablets. So it's, I mean, we're still trying to get books out there. We're, we're figuring out solutions, but, 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 but we're still trying to do stuff, even though we, were, we can't physically be present for, for our patrons right now. I want to kind of go back to the tablet piece because now it's really interesting that so with, and just to clarify, so Diego, you're working with jails and Melinda and, and Matthew are working with prisons, just to, to yeah. make sure that the people understand that, and they are, um, Kind of uh, managed, and the the rules and regulations are different for each each of those facilities. So I want to make sure we clarify that. So and then can I also just provide more yeah. context too? Because I feel like I haven't really. I, I like the most of my patrons um, haven't been sentenced, so there's a lot of turnover. Um, there are people who are there for a couple years if 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 their trial goes on for a long time or they're appealing. But then there's also people who are who, who are serving shorter sentences of one to two years. Um, so so I mean you do see people that are there for slightly longer. But yeah, again, our, our turnover is 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 rather big and more now because of the pandemic. There's not that many people currently incarcerated. It seems like the numbers are really low. I'm seeing that up in this area too with the jails that I work with. So Matthew, Melinda, do you have tablets as well? We do have tablets, okay. yes. So for Matthew and Melissa, or Belinda, your tablets are, they're provided, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, they're provided by a third party vendor. Right. And they're provided for free. The, the, the physical item is provided for free. Yes. But then to, for an individual to be able to access, are they able to access the public domain books for free or to download the books, do yes. they have to pay for that? Both. They get the public domain books are free. They can purchase books. They also can um, access email for a fee as well. What's the, av do, you, do you know kind of what the average cost of the books are? I do not. Okay. It, it, it's, I know it's usually pretty heavily uh, discounted, but I, I think it's very, I, I mean, it's very exciting to me, Diego, that that there are tablets that are not uh, third party. I don't think I should probably mention the name of the third party, but the, that they're that they're tablets that are not third party controlled um, in correctional facilities. I think that's really awesome, and I I would love to see that more places because um, you know some of the ebooks and materials that are available to incarcerated populations um, are really um, not sufficient and the fact that they're not curated that I know of by any library or librarians is really um, upsetting because uh, it's it's just it, it seems like they just anyway I don't want to go too much into it but I, <laughs> it seems like like it seems like they went to gutenberg.org and then yes. just selected things at random um, exactly. yeah there's really no uh, rhyme or reason to the, the things that they provide them. Um, yeah. 
and it's not, I don't want people to think, oh, it's like, oh, they have over, like, kind of the equivalent of overdrive. It's not at mm-hmm. all that. No. At, at all. At all. And they also, um, I want to also make sure that people understand that it's, they're, they don't have internet access. No. Correct. They have to plug it into a thing yeah. to, to download the materials. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, want it, it, it's not like the tablets that most of us know and use. Um, it, it still is much more restricted. So, I agree. Diego, keep talking up your program. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep up, and, and I, I will help kind of get the word out of that. Since we're, we're talking about, um, you know, books and curating, can, let's talk about how you approach collection development. Um, and what type of resources you, you know, Diego, you look to put on your cart um, and get to the, the individuals. And, and Matthew and Melissa, what do you look to? Melinda, I'm sorry, I keep getting the name wrong there. <laughs> Melinda. Okay. I get that. <laughs> uh, Melinda, what you look to have on your shelves as well as both um, and through ILL too. And I'll let whoever wants to start go right ahead. Go ahead, Matthew. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I approach collection development in a systematic uh, and data-driven way uh, because we have an integrated library system, although antiquated at Woodburn. Uh, I am able to still pull circulation statistics um, regularly and look at trends and changes and you know deficiencies in the collection where I can improve things. Um, and I did that pretty much as soon as I was uh, hired and put in Woodburn just so that I could get a feel for, you know, uh, and I think every new librarian, wherever they are, really should do that to kind of take the pulse of the library to see what is what is being read and, and what is circulating and um, where things need to be improved. Um, really, I think that's, you know, I mean, if you're not using circulation statistics and input from your community, um, what are you, how are you developing your collection? Because I think, you know, I think it's dangerous that some, some newer librarians, they, they, they give in to the lure of, of whim and, um, whim is not a good way to develop collections. Um, so. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I actually, I never even had a budget until almost a year ago when Willard went through a lot of changes. Um, the budget that I used to develop the collection was the ASAP budget. And um, so my 600s is literally three shelves full of um, treatment oriented, um, self-help, those kinds of books. So I was given the go ahead to go ahead and get fiction within the last uh, six months or so, and I've just been buying fiction ferociously, you know, like every James Patterson title, every Lee Child title. So everybody's really excited about that, um, including the COs and the civilians. But, <laughs> but um, so I've laid off of the nonfiction for a while. And um, once I get that done, though, I will weed heavily that 600s because a lot of that stuff is dated back to, you know, 1995 when the facility switched over to the drug treatment campus. Um, but yeah, I just, I make sure I keep communicating with, you know, the inmates when they come in, what do they want? You know, I have post-it notes all over the place with titles and authors and and when they say, oh, do you have this and do you have that? Um, you know, I'll take note of it, but I did develop my own policy and um, I, do, I do stick to it. You know, if it doesn't serve a good majority of the population, um, if it's not going to get used by enough of um, the patrons, then I won't buy it. Or if it's too cost prohibitive, you know, there's some of that stuff in there too. But yeah. And that's where I hope that kind of as the library system that we can supplement and support those needs if it's, you know, you've got a really, really specific, unique title, hopefully one of the system you know, libraries, member libraries has it and we can get it to you to borrow. That, that's how I kind of view our role. Um, but unfortunately, many of us are not lending or, or yeah. providing that service in the very moment. So we're, but Diego, how do you kind of decide what books to put on the cards? Um, so we go back to the uphill battle conversation where, um, so 
because we have uh, operated from, from Rikers Island for so long, um, Rikers Island is technically considered in the Bronx. So, okay, sorry, to give you more context, um, Brooklyn Public Library isn't the only library system that is present at Rikers Island. Um, Queens Public Library and New York Public Library, which are two separate systems, also work from there. Because we're all work, we all work at Rikers, either at the same facilities or different facilities, but when it gets counted, because the Rikers is in the Bronx, it gets counted, all the numbers we count get counted for New York Public Library because the facility is in the Bronx, which means we basically get zero money from the state for, for collections. Um, so like Melinda, we, we I, I, finally last year, we, it seemed that we were finally getting like somewhat of a steady number, something that I could work with and sort of be like, this is how I'm gonna use the money throughout the year. Um, unfortunately, then the pandemic happened and bye bye budget. I, um, I have money to spend, but I'm not sure how much money. And so for the longest time, our systems relied on donations. And I think for the past colleagues that I've had, I think had very much the mentality of like, having anything is okay, you know? Stuff that people aren't gonna read is okay, uh, which isn't. Um, I don't think, I, you know, we've had, We've had so many issues where it's because we don't weed out our donations, people aren't happy with what we have, right? Um, so, I'm, I'm sorry, this is long-winded and, 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 and sort of, um, so, so um, I mean, we have money, and so, I don't know. Again, um, there are certain facilities that we serve, for instance, that w where it's like, we know that individuals are there to detox as well, right? So we... So depending on the pen, we also serve an infirmary. And so depending on the facility we're at, I think it's, you listen to the needs of, of the people there. Um, we don't also, because our collection is separate from the main library, it means that the only way we can keep track of our books is by paper, right? We don't have like any electronic, we can't keep, we don't have any way of keeping like count of stuff too, because also part of the issue is like, because there's such a huge turnover. I see someone one week and then the next I don't and that book is gone forever. 80% of the books that we have circulating, we never see back. Um, again, because of the nature of, of, of the facilities, everyone's moving around, there's searches, then the CEOs take the books and then we never see them again. There's just lack of communication between the CEOs, the civilians, us. So yeah, so, yeah. but I feel like you 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 get a sense of what people want you it, it, we take requests all the time um we with the caveat of like we are mostly a donation based uh service we can't necessarily provide specific titles but give it to us and then maybe when we have the budget we can buy that book so like after a long time of i think just doing service and like taking requests like you you realize what people want to read like obviously it's not like you don't want to generalize anything but like like Patterson and Dean Koontz and all the popular, like, yeah, I th yeah, there are, I don't know, it, it, it's, we're trying to figure out ways in which moving away from like, yeah, donate whatever you want so we can have a bunch of random books on our card that nobody's going to read and people are going to resent us or just try and listen to the people that we serve and try and fit, try and like really get the books that they want to read. And, and, so, and sort of stop having this attitude of, I know better, you should be reading this, instead of you were telling me what you want me to, what I want, what you want to read. And so how do I work with that? And, and how do I work with other organizations to try and get donations, work within the library, within the library and all the branches to make sure that when they're weeding out material, it's material that I need and not just anything, you know? But it, again, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. I think uh, it was a really good reminder lesson for me, and you, you've all kind of said it, but um, that people are people, and we all like to read. I mean, what's popular in a public library, a lot of times is also popular in a 
correctional facility. Like it, it's people. We like to read the same things, um, and so that I, when I talk to people about that, they're they're like shocked, and it's like, no, James Patterson is popular everywhere. Like that's, it's James Patterson. Mm -hmm. it, that, that's what it is. So, yeah, collection development. Is, you're doing good, all of you. Um. Can you, kind of switching gears a little bit, well, a lot bit, um, how do you all balance the need for, so libraries, uh, you know, we, our services we want, you know, we, we espouse that we are, you know, open and welcoming to all and, and we want to provide services to everybody. But when you're working in a facility, you have also this, this balance of safety and security. Um, and things are, very different than what it's like in a public library in some ways in some respects so how do you balance um kind of making trying to provide the the right not the right atmosphere but a, a, a positive atmosphere with the restrictions you might be working with who wants to take it i mean i can i can chime in about that. Um, so just to preface it, I, I, uh, a, a very abridged version of my background and experience. Um, so I've worked on and off in public libraries since the age of 16. And then I've also had over a decade of security experience in private and public facilities. Um, I've also worked with um, uh, What's the, what's the word these days? Um, uh, child and family service, um, kids that have uh, treatment facilities for kids that have multiple diagnoses um, tend to be ultra violent or um, anyways. So I, I, that's kind of my background. Um, so having both of those makes the balancing act a little easier. Um, and I see both security and public library work as forms of service um, and in, in which, you know, cultivating an air of approachability and consistency are, you know, hugely beneficial um, in both. Um, yeah, so trust is a, is a, trust is a funny and loaded term <laughs> behind bars as uh, Melinda and I'm sure Diego and other people can kind of tell you um, but both, you know, both the, the incarcerated and non-incarcerated populations at Woodburn know that they can trust me to do my job. Um, and I think that's, that's the biggest part um, is, you know, they feel safe and secure because they can rely on me consistently doing my job. And I think that's, the, I mean, that's, that's really the biggest part and they know that even if I tell them no because I can't get them specific information about say you know I, I've had I've actually had people request books on locksmithing um, and you know that I can't get you a book on locksmithing <laughs> I'm sorry um, and it's you know there are specific directives um, uh, within within the state that, that um, you know prohibit certain things but um, you know locksmithing is right out you can't you can't have a book on locksmithing in, in prison um, there's a really good quote from, and I don't have it at hand, but um, Brenda Vogel, who writes the Prison Library um, Primer, which is an excellent book, and I recommend anybody who's interested in prison librarianship to read it. Um, that she quotes, actually, I think it was a student intern who uh, started to work in a prison library, and the, the kind of, to kind of paraphrase, it was ultimately, you know, they, they, if they had subscribed to the rehabilitation kind of uh, mode of collection development or being a librarian, then they would have done this. If they were more punitive, they would have done this. But ultimately what it came down to is they just wanted to be a librarian. And that's, that's, what, that's what I try to do is I just, I am there to be a librarian. I'm not there to punish. I'm not there to rehabilitate. I'm there to provide information. And so I think, you know, by consistently doing my job, that creates that um, environment of safety and security. Yeah, um, I'll go. 
Same thing. I, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with communication. Um, I try to make everybody feel like, you know, that library is their library. It's not my library. Um, I've been around librarians who are kind of like territorial and like, this is my library. These are my books and I'm going to take complete control of them. Um, but I, I want them to feel like I'm an information resource, you know, not just the books, but if I can look up stuff for them, um, you know, get the information into their hands um, and just always making them feel like it's a, you know, a welcoming place. Um, but yeah, I also have um, some security stuff in my background as well, working with juveniles. And uh, I think that really sets the stage for you when you went, like when I transitioned into um, prison in an adult situation, a lot of that stuff that I learned back then serves me well now too. Yeah. But yep, it is. And like you said, it's a balance. Um, you don't want to be, you know, extremely one way or the other. Um, but yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I, I would echo what Matthew said. Matthew put it really, really, really well. Um, and, and for us, it's interesting because so like when we're doing uh, cart service, it depends on every facility, whether we're, we are escorted by a CO. And I, I, I'd say that the, one of the places where I don't get escorted and I have freedom of movement, it's also one, probably one of the places where I'd be technically most vulnerable at, right? But I feel like what Matthew said is once you establish that relationship and once you're, once they realize that you're not a CEO, you are there basically to meet their needs and you're there to try and help them. I think that really changes the attitude of how they see you and the relationship you create with, with the individuals. Um, Those are all really good answers. Thank you. <laughs> Um, you know, as we're wrapping up, is there anything that anybody would like to add, kind of one, whether it's a parting a tip of advice or something that kind of didn't get, that you really wanted to, to mention? Um, yeah, I have something. Um, and it's kind of related to, um, you know, what is the best part of the job? Um, but I, 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 in a kind of in a roundabout way, I would just encourage, you know, any librarian who is passionate about helping others to consider prison librarianship. Um, you know, the, the incarcerated population is probably one of the most technologically and physically isolated communities in the country, period. Um, it's just a fact. They're, they're incredibly isolated. Um, and it's hugely rewarding to be, to be able to connect these incredibly isolated people with the information that they need. Um, so I would really recommend anybody who's a passionate librarian who really wants to connect people with the information that they need to consider prison librarianship. librarianship. I would take that even further and say, I mean, at least for instance, in New York City, there's so many different organizations that are working inside the jail and there's so many ways that people can get involved and so much like knowledge that people have that can also be useful inside of facilities. So I know New York City, there's plenty of uh, opportunities. I know other, other cities have other opportunities. So if you're really interested in helping people inside of jails, there are, there are plenty of opportunities chances out there. Every county in New York State has a jail. And if you talk to the person, um, so at your library system, at your public library system, if you reach out to them, um, we can connect you because we all work with our county jails. So and we also work with our prisons too. So we've, we can kind of, if you don't know where to go, we, we can help be that, we can be the resource to make those connections. Oh, you're muted again, Andrea. My 
fingers are getting in the way. <laughs> I want to thank all of you. I, I really enjoyed this discussion. Um, and kind of, I know I, I learned quite a few new things um, that I'm going to be taking back to the facilities that I work with. Um, and, and I hope that um, everybody kind of takes to heart both kind of what Matthew and Diego uh, um, talked about, about, you know, getting involved because this, this really is, um, it is one of the most rewarding things that I get to do, um, one of my favorite parts of my job, and it, it really is supporting individuals who are so often forgotten. Um, and so I want to thank all of you for doing the work that you are doing and for, for everybody um, who's listening to this, um, for whether the work that you already are doing or that you are inspired to go, go forth and do after listening to this. Um, it, it really is truly important work, hard and challenging work, but so, so very important. So thank you all um, for, for giving your time right here and for giving your time throughout to do this work. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, thanks everyone. Um, th this was so great. Um, this concludes the NILA 2020 on-demand program. Congrats, you're a prison librarian. Now what? We hope you continue to take advantage of all the on-demand and live programs the NILA 2020 annual virtual conference has to offer. Thank you for helping us make this the best virtual conference ever. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.